And of course, you're familiar with Exodus 20, verse 1 through 6, because I want to talk about cutting the navel cord. How to be able to deal with past situations that might be influencing your present. Past things that happen in your life. Because healing sometimes begins way back there. Healing begins at the moment. Healing begins when you consider it. When you sit down with your children and with your grandparents, with your grandmother, grandfather, and the grandfather at the age of 70 says to you, I just want to ask you all to forgive me. That's very important. Biblically, spiritually, in terms of uh, uh, family healing, it's an oasis of blessings when a grandfather asks forgiveness for something that he did. And so, I want to look at Exodus 20. Uh, verses 1 through 6. God spoke these words saying, I'm the Lord your God which brought you out of the end of Egypt, house of bondage. You have no other gods before me. Do not make any, yourself any graven image. Now bow down to them or serve them. For I am a vis, I, I am a I'm the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the children to the third and fourth generation of them who hate me. Notice, only visiting the children to the third and fourth generation of those that hate God, but showing mercy to thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. So before you call me some type of a person that uh, uh, deals with the past too much, I want us to read the end of the verse, verse 5, verse 6, showing mercy to thousands of them who love me and keep my commandments. So mercy is greater than condemnation. Mercy is greater. Obey is greater than sacrifice. And so I want to sort of read some scriptures again, I told you, to begin the Bible study. And uh, Deuteronomy 7, 5 through 9. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, 5, it says, I wanted to make sure this is right. Deuteronomy 7, 5 through 9. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For you are a holy people unto the Lord your God. Your God has chosen you as a special people unto himself. Above all the people who are upon the face of this earth, Talking to Israel. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were a few, fewest of all people. So we're dealing with the love of God for Israel and how he cares for them and loved them abundantly. I think verse 9 says, You therefore, the Lord your God, is a, is a God, faithful God, who keeps covenants and mercy with them who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Meaning, I know you're a very small group of people there in Israel, but I have a covenant with you. And if you keep and, 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 and hear my words, Keep the covenants and mercy with them who love him and keep his commandments. I'll bless you for a thousand years. And of course, there's more. Psalm 105, 8. I want to take this time, okay? Because these scriptures are very important in order to make a case this morning to our Bible study. Psalm 105, verse 8. Is that what it is? Psalm, Psalm 105, verse 8. Let's take a look. It takes a little little time.
but it's, he has remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Should the Lord enter a covenant with Israel, he has not forgotten it. In spite of all the wars and all the problems that Israel has, there is a covenant with God, with Israel, that it's God is going to be fulfilled. He has not forgotten and will never forget. In essence, it has been suspended for approximately 2,000 years, but will once again flower into full potential at the second coming. All right. Another scripture that deals with this thousand year generations is Psalm 102, 25, 28. Psalm 102, 25, 28. Of old have you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They shall perish, but you shall endure, yes, all of them shall wax of old like a garment. As a vesture shall you change them, and they shall be changed. But you are the same, and your ears shall have no end. And then it says in verse 20, The children of your servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before you. Again, it refers to Israel, which will be restored and will worship God forever. And so the idea of forever, eternal, covered with Israel, and with us that serve the Lord, you've got to consider that as you deal with family. You have to know that there is a hand of God upon your family that he wants to change, and it's a question of you believing and calling forth and praying. And what an amazing thing. I have a brother, my oldest brother, that didn't talk to us for 20 years, and my mother prayed for him for 20 years. Well, we're dear friends today. He changed completely. And so, uh, of course, Galatians 3, verses 1 through 14 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So I'm through with all the scriptures. So now let, let me share with you our, our Bible study. Amen. When you deal with a thousand years generations and things like that, You have to look at uh, the problem of sin because Jesus died in, to redeem us from the curse of the law. And yet, when you're not redeemed, you are under the curse. But you don't have to be under the curse. You can be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So a curse will not rob your salvation because you have become free from it by the blood of Christ. So let me make some statements here in order to deal with that. And I'll show you some examples of a family, the Kalikak family from New York, who obeyed and disobeyed God. It's a study of genealogy that is very, very precise. It's a nice book. I read it. A curse is the root of a sin that persists. A curse is a root of sin that persists. Don't you battle a sin in your life that you can't get rid of it? Don't you have a sin somewhere in there that you try desperately to, to overcome, but you can't because you feel like uh, you're under pressure, you're in bondage, you're just all over the place. So, of course it's a sin, the root of sin that persists, bringing you to receive condemnation. But there is therefore now no combination in those who are in Christ Jesus. So to, to understand the heart of the sinner is to be sensitive to their sin. You see, it's an interesting thing. If you don't talk about sin, you're not able to deal with it. And so the church that is friendly church, you just simply just don't talk about these things. But as we study these things, and there are hundreds of you who have families and children, I say a curse is a root of sin that persists. Number two, 
The carnal mind is enmity with God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Meaning, how to get rid of a carnal mind? If, if you don't deal with a carnal mind, then you don't deal with a problem which, which is a hidden sin in your life that has to be dealt with. Number three, the sins of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation until you break its power. In other words, a sin persists to become a curse that you cannot deal with it, but until you, resp- you go to the altar and you take communion to say, God, I believe in you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe that my family is experiencing situations that are unbearable. There are several unemployed people in my family. There are several people who are very ill, very sick all the time. I break that curse of illness and sickness and sin upon my life in Jesus' name. And you begin to get results from that. Next. A curse is a position of disobedience to the Father that leads to trouble throughout your life and can rob your salvation if you do not take authority against it by the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's a real thing. It's a real Why is it that there's so much suicide in the, in the realm of your family or your church or your, 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 your situation? And you wonder why in the world people want to kill themselves because there's unresolved issues that have not been dealt with by anybody. Why does a child, 18-year-old, hang himself in the basement? Because there were problems in that child that nobody want to talk about it in order to be people friendly. And then when the child dies, we, we stand up and say, I don't understand. Well, you don't understand because you're not paying attention. When there's a problem that is not dealt with, it's a curse that is activating into the life of a child who can commit, commit, commit suicide. And so I'm not just speaking here to, to fill up the blanket or spending time. I'm dealing with issues that are very serious upon the life of the church. And any pastor or minister who sort of a, puts me down going to have to deal with the Lord. You don't do that. You don't put anybody down. If, if God is with me, why can you? Why should should you be against me? All right. I'm speaking my mind this morning. Amen. Okay. Now, next, sin brings death before and after Jesus. And I've been thinking about that. Sin brings death before and after Jesus. So all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I understand. But it is before Jesus and after Jesus. Amen? The difference after Jesus is that sin can be forgiven. How about that? Sin can be forgiven. If you ask or confess them before the Lord, it's dealt with. That is why we take communion. First Sunday in our church, sometimes every single Sunday, at a little church south of uh, Athens, Georgia, in Bishop, Georgia, called Race Chapel. The pastor there is Jerry Varnado. And he takes communion every Sunday, just like a good Catholic. And, And we love it. We love it. We love it. It's important, very important, because it gives us an opportunity to to, uh, ask forgiveness for our sins. Now, when you deal with sin upon the altar, upon the cup, and upon the bread, remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross, the possibility of you living is very high. You know, I I spent the morning this morning in prayer, and I pray in the Spirit, by the way. I just love to pray in the Spirit. And I'm praying in the Spirit, in the Spirit, and I, I, I could see my battery just blinking. Blink, 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 blink. Plick, plick, like a battery being charged. Plick, 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 plick. And my spirit began getting sweet, and I began to rejoice, and before too long, the tears came on. What happened is that I brought my sins to Jesus. I went to him, and I said, Lord, howdy doody. Good to see you. You, my Lord, and my Savior, and my Redeemer, I love you to death. I love you, 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 Lord Jesus. Thank you for forgiving my sin. 
Amen. All right. Next. I don't know which number it is because I just messed up the whole thing. So let's take it. Next. We are blessed by obeying the word of God and cursed for disobeying the word of God. We're blessed by obeying and cursed by disobeying. And so there's a battle between human beings as to doing what you want to do and not doing what you should do. What is it? Paul said, the things that I hate, I do it. The things that I love, I don't do them. And that's the struggle of a Christian. Now, it's okay to have the struggle. Matter of fact, I invite you to have this struggle of being in and out, on and off. It's okay. Because it shows that you are dealing with eternity. And when you deal with eternity, you are on. You are precious. You are good. Congratulations. Way to go, man. Fantastic. Okay? That's the way that every Christian should be, on and off. All right, now, not all the time, but it's okay to be on and off. Does that agree? Okay. Next. I want to say this to you because you might, you, you might clarify your influencers, people that influence your life. And there's a lot of people that influence other people's lives based on their own experience. And when you're based on their own experience, nobody can grow above your pastor because everybody begins looking like the pastor. Listen to, listen to me this morning. A ministry not led of the Holy Spirit will have everybody looking the same. A witch, a witch is a woman who carries within her the seed of rebellion against God and practices witchcraft. What is witchcraft? Witchcraft is influencing people to where you are and putting on them all your doubts and fears, thinking that you're helping them. But you're not helping them. You are passing the buck, meaning you are troubled. You are doing witchcraft, which is exalting, which is moving ahead of the, the move of the Holy Spirit, denying the presence of God through the Holy Spirit. That is a witch. And you should have in church a couple of them, or three or four. Amen. A wizard on the other side is a man that does the same. Good. Now, I've got 11 minutes and 56 seconds. A certain man, for example, commits incest with his sisters. He broke a commandment of the Lord in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 22. You should not lay down with, with family members. Incest first took place in the Bible when Lot's daughters laid with him after offering him wine. Genesis 19, verses 10 to 38. Go ahead and read Genesis 19, 10 to 38. Open your Bible and read that. The result of that was two sons, Moab and Ben-Ami, father of the Amorites. These two children became bitter enemies of Abraham's descendants. Lot's children became bitter enemies with Abraham's descendants. First Samuel 14, 47. Second Chronicles 20, verse 1. The Amorites became polytheistic people. Remember, I'm talking about the two children that came out of Lot's daughters. The, more, the result of incest between Lot and his daughters provided two children, Moab's and ben -Ami. All right. The Amorites became polytheistic, meaning they worship all kinds of gods, which include children sacrifice, religious prostitution, and divination. Their god was Milcom. 
1 Kings 11, 15. Now, how incest is under the four-generation curse? How do you deal with that? You can count and see. A lot of people study genealogy of families and what happened with them. The children of this relationship between Lot and his daughter suffered for 400 years of retardation and insanity. As years progressed, mental illness became more subtle. At the end of the 400 years, approached symptoms of schizophrenia, paranoia, and confusion became evident. If you study the Amorites, which I did, you'll find traces of mental illness that led them to idolatry and search for gods of stone to solve their problems. Now, let's take a look at this a little bit so you can see. So, the two daughters of Lot got them drunk and had intercourse with their father. The result of that was two children. And the names of the children was Moab and Benami, which later became enemies of Abraham. First Samuel 14, 47. So the Amorites became polytheistic people. Practicing divination, their God was Milcom. Now, in Sestis, then, let's take a look at the last paragraph that I read. The children of this relationship between Lot and his daughters suffer for 400 years of retardation and insanity. Are you smiling there? Yeah. Okay, good. As the years progressed, mental illness became more subtle. At the end of 400 years, symptoms of schizophrenia, paranoia, and confusion became evident. And, of course, you study the Amorites, you're going to find that that's true. In other words, study the Amorites. You're going to find that the result of incest is 400, a 400-year 400 curse. Now, back in 19 or whatever, young guy, a young buck, 40 years old, I wanted to know more about the Amorites. So I began to study about the Amorites, and I came to a, an interesting conclusion. And it really happened in the, a book called the Kalikak, K-A-L-L-I-K-A-K, -A -L -L -K -K, Family. It's in a book by H.H. H. Goddard, Goddard, Macmillan Company, New York, 1927. It's a very interesting book. And it, it dealt with the Kalika family. The father was Mr. Martin Sr. He was good English blood, middle class. Both parents, both parents were feeble-minded, meaning they were psychologically impaired. From him came 41 mates, 226, 222 feeble-minded children, mentally ill. And only, and only two normal children. So out of the marriage, Mr. Martin and his wife, 41 mates came through that. In other words, there were 41 children, 222 feeble-minded children. Only two were, were balanced. Only two were normal. Let begin. The first family that came out of it was an honorable family. It seems like they overcame. From it came nine, 496 descendants, all normal. 496 descendants from, from the first generation of Kalika family were normal. Three listed as degenerates, two alcoholics, one sexually loose. All the legitimate children married into better families. Their state became colonial governors, doctors. Lawyers, judges, educators, traders, landowners, and respectable citizens. Among them was found no feeble-mindedness, psychologically impaired, no illegitimate children, no immoral women, no, no epilepsy, no criminals, and no keepers of the house of prostitution. 
out of 496 descendants, only 15 children died in infancy. One case of insanity, two victims of habitual drunkenness, and that was it. The Kalika family in the first generation was abundantly blessed. At the close, you read this book, I'll be glad to provide for you the information. At the close of the War of Independence, the father, Martin Jr., went to a pub to celebrate the end of the war. There in an inebriated state, he intercoursed with a woman who was feeble-minded, being psychologically impaired. An illegitimate son, Martin Jr., was born. Of that son, Martin Jr., this, 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 this study says that 480 descendants, only 46 were found to be normal. 36 were illegitimate, 33 drunks, 24 alcoholics, 3 epileptics, 82 died in infancy, 3 criminals, 8 keepers of house of ill repute. In other words, out of this large group, some 1,146 offsprings were birthed. There were 262 feeble-minded, 197 considered normal. 581 undetermined. We couldn't find them, and there's no history of them. So I'm saying to you, incest in terms of family, it's a great reality in the life of the church. It's been said that the normal traditional church has at least 6% of incest. What, what does it mean, incest? It's more child abuse. That will perhaps translate to today. More, 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 more clear. Uh, child abuse, meaning there are parents, fathers that use their children. So, in a sense, that type of thing has to be dealt with accordingly. I want to stop now because I think that's a mouthful in it. It is a mouthful. Yeah. Now, I don't want to stay in here. This depresses me. But I just want you to know. That, uh, that through Christ you can break this curse. How do you do to break the curse? You receive Christ as your Savior. You confess Him as your Lord. You say, Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I have sinned against you and have mercy upon my life. And, oh, and that, that's all. It goes on. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. And I hope you'll be with me tomorrow. If I offended you, please forgive me, but I had to say it. Bye-bye.